traveling back here, we might end up up here. So I, I just want to thank you all, as well as Pastor Simon, for giving me the opportunity to be your speaker for your final Sabbath of the year. And I want to thank you all in advance for listening to me for the next however long I stand up here for. <laughs> I, I am surprised, I have to say, at how slow 2019 has been, but also how fast 2019 has been. I felt like it started a little bit steady and slow, and then all of a sudden, it was 2019, it's over, and it's time for 2020. And it's been a great year for me, I have to say. Um, of course, not without its challenges, but I've had an opportunity to really go into other um, hobbies and activities, and I like to call them more adult things that I do now. You know, I'm almost 30, so I, you know, it's downhill from here, I heard. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is I've been really leaning into series and Bible studies and meeting with women, um, young women, um, mixed generational groups who are studying things from the Bible or are going to youth study groups wherever they might be, wherever they might meet. And one of the um, small group series that I've been following is about the soul, the health of the soul. The series, in fact, is entitled, How is Your Soul? In this series, um, the lead pastor, Pastor Smith, Smith, he breaks down the duality of man's existence, you know, we're flesh and we're spirit, by focusing on, by focusing on the well-being of the soul. This idea that you can have it all on the outside, you can be okay in the flesh, but be lacking and small in the spirit. Um, I hear you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Let's start over. Good morning. <laughs> so, uh, but going back to this idea of the soul, that you can have it all, I could have had it right here, but I need to make sure I'm taking time to check on my soul. So I thought to myself, let me ask myself this question. Liz, how is your soul? And I didn't like my answer. Um, it seems, or at least I found, that when I took some time to check in my soul, I've been in a state of rest restlessness or almost longing for a very long time now and probably all of 2019. And I completely missed it because I was so focused on the other things that were checking off and working out well. So this morning, when I was thinking of what I wanted to speak to you about today, I thought maybe I should go the jolly holiday ride, uh, route, you know, God is good because he is, you know, happy holidays, or maybe give you a New Year's mantra, you know, 2020 vision, same God, new you, how are we gonna go into 2020? But I realized I couldn't possibly be the only person in this state of longing, in the state of being satisfied in the flesh, but somehow still longing and searching for something else. So I thought instead that we would work through this together. And if that's okay, that's where I want to start. I want to work through with you, where do we go when we now know that our soul is longing for something? What's the next step for this? Let's bow our heads for a head for a quick word of prayer. Right. Lord, thank you so much for choosing me to be a vessel to me, but you and I both know that if you do not show up, nothing's going to happen. So I'm asking you to show up. I'm asking you to speak through me. I'm asking you to speak to your people, to your children, and may every one of us, myself included, leave here with what you need us to have to make it through the next hour belong we need to make it through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As a little girl, I was obsessed with my father. You know I love my stories. It's story time. I was obsessed with my father. I was the ultimate daddy's girl. In fact, if you gave me a choice, which one day my, you know, my grandmother who's here, um, she won't understand this too well, so I'm going to go ahead and say the story. We'll play this now, as I look back, a pretty cruel game. She'll ask me if I had a choice between my father and my mother, who would I choose? And my response would be, well, my dad can always remarry. That's how much I love my father. To me, my dad, was 
next to God. When I envisioned God, God was here and my dad was probably right here and on a really good day, probably right next to God for me. And whenever I was scared of something or whenever something wasn't going right, my mind would come up with an image of my father. I know and I remember that I used to be very afraid of thunder and lightning. So in my parents' bedroom where we lived was upstairs and my siblings and I, we were in a bedroom on the, on the first floor, the main floor. So if it's thundering and it's lightning and it's dark, you're not going to chance it and run outside to outside of your room to take the stairs to go upstairs. So you're going to lay in your bed and just hope that it goes away. And one of the images, one of the things that I always imagined was a picture of my father, like this massive giant in the backyard, um, in his favorite shirt. He used to have this favorite button-down shirt. And it was just the ugliest bird poop colored shirt you've ever seen. And it had collars here with short sleeves, and he would pair it with the weirdest colored pants, and the pants would come up to here. Um, and sometimes, if he really wants to make a fashion statement, he would wear them with these shoe sandals. That it, it was really horrendous. But I would picture my father in, that, in this outfit, in the backyard, fighting off the thunder, fighting off the lightning, and I could go back to bed. In the, same, um, in, similar, in the same way, whenever I went to school, if I was having trouble at school, or if I was being seized, or if I was having issues with my friend, I would look forward to getting home to my dad, because for whatever reason, he was my safe place. He was a hiding place. He was a security blanket. And I don't think he ever knew it, because it's not something he ever necessarily said, or something he ever necessarily did to earn this status you know, on this high place on this podium of my life, it was just that I liked spending time with my dad. And being with him made everything okay. So he didn't need to know that he was doing it. It's just that as a child, that's where I always went. It renewed my strength to face another day, and I always knew that everything would be okay. As humans, we have this innate longing to return home, to unite with something, to merge, to belong. But the question always remains, with what? What are we longing to, that no matter what we do, no matter what we search, no matter what we achieve or gain, or no matter, no matter how much we connect with family, we still sometimes feel a longing. And what is this, long, this restlessness that we all share at our core? As a frequent traveler, I, I'm always on the move. Um, I'm very familiar with longing to go home. Um, but when I long to go home, my mind pictures my couch, it pictures my bed, it pictures my kitchen, and then it comes up with a plan. This is how we're gonna go home. Maybe I'm calling an Uber, maybe I'm getting on a train, maybe I'm getting on a plane. But my mind knows that this longing for home means she wants to go there and we're gonna get there. And the same thing happens if you're someone who's into success. The same thing happens if you're someone who's into family. Whatever it is that, that you want, if you want to be a nurse, your mind pictures you in scrubs, and then it says you need to go to school, study this, do this, and then you will be a nurse. But I'm not talking about these wants and these needs. This is not about the home and the family and stability. This is about that feeling you get when everything is great, and you're surrounded by all the good, the good things and everything is going well, but you're still restless. You still feel this need to get away from everything that's good and even be alone and you can't quite explain it. You know you're in need of something, but you can't conceptualize, conceptualize what it is. I once read that the soul knows what it wants, but the mind can't process images that have never been there. So your soul knows what it wants, but because what the soul is asking for has never really tangibly existed, you know, you've never really been able to touch what your soul is asking for, your mind can't quite come up with a plan for how to get your soul to that rest, to that peace that it's searching for. And as I said a million times, even though 2019 has been great and God has come through for me many times in the most undeserving ways, because I put myself in situations that honestly, if I were God, I'd be like, girl, I have other people to worry about. But he always comes through for me, and I'm ending this year grateful and longing, grateful and humble, but with a longing soul, with a wanting soul. And this isn't the first time I've been in a space like this. In fact, I know that I'm going to be okay this time around because I've been here before 
for much, much, much more circumstances. In my early 20s, I was going through a really, really, really rough, difficult time in life. Everything just felt like a mess. Nothing felt right. And I remember that it got to the point, to the point that I was just so fed up with life that I would wake up in tears because God had kept me for another day. Now, it was interesting because I wasn't suicidal. I loved me, and I had no interest in taking me away. And it was also interesting that I knew then and recognized that the, my life is not mine to take, but I, and I knew that it came from a source, and I knew that it was up to that source to take back my life if, if it wanted to, but I was upset because God chose to keep me around. I couldn't understand why God would choose to make me, then have me go through all of these things, and then keep me suffering in all of these things. And it came to a point where I was in just so much pain. And it wasn't a physical pain. I couldn't point to my arm. I couldn't point to my head. I couldn't point to my heart or my arms. I couldn't take medicine for it. I couldn't sleep it away. It was a different kind of pain. It was, it was outside of me, but inside of me at the same time. It was almost, I think the word is metaphysical. It was almost, I couldn't touch this pain. It was like my soul was hurting, my heart was heavy. And I had gotten to the point where every breath at this point felt heavy. Breathing became an effort. So one morning I was so upset when I woke up. Upset with God at this point, if we're being honest. Um, I rolled out of bed, I rolled onto the carpet, and I said, I'm just going to lay here until you choose to take me. I can be very dramatic at times. I can, I can take it very far if someone leads me to my own devices. So I was prepared to lay there for weeks because my family was away for the summer and I just had decided not to travel with them. So I had the house to myself. So in my mind, I can lay here as long as I need to lay here, God, because I need you to end this suffering for me. So I laid there silent, still, quiet, for what seemed like probably days, but you know, I'm pretty sure it was no less than 30 minutes at that point. And then something happened. In laying still, I was able to silence my mind. I was able to quiet the voices and the feelings because I was just sitting there waiting on God to do what I asked him to do. And then I was overcome by this feeling. And it wasn't in my body again. It was again the same place I felt the pain that I'm now feeling this strange feeling. I'm being taken over and I can't quite reach it. I can't quite touch it. I can't quite feel where this feeling is coming up or, or understand where it's coming from, but it's coming. For whatever reason, laying there in the quiet settled my being. I was no longer in my head. I was somewhere else. And I've had this familiar feeling before. I felt this before. And I'm realizing that lying on the ground took me right back to my dad, who at the time, I no longer had in my life. Lying there still and quiet, that feeling of going home to my father was rushing back. I had lost my mind, or left my mind, actually lost my mind, because if you're ready to lay and die, you have literally lost your mind. But in losing my mind, I had found my soul. I had reached to the core of my being and where everything I am starts and stems from. And it was as if someone pulled a blanket over my soul. I don't think I will ever be able to accurately and effectively ex express or explain this feeling. It's almost as if someone pulled a blanket over my soul, not over me, over my soul, and embraced it. And now all of a sudden I could breathe again. And my struggles hadn't changed. My world was still the same. I was still on the floor. I was still on the carpet. But now I had a renewed spirit. Now I wasn't asking for God to end it. Now I was just here. I could breathe again. I didn't mind breathing again. I wanted to breathe again. And I knew I could face another day. That moment changed my life. And it changed my life for two reasons. One, I realized that every time little Liz, that little girl, little Elizabeth, 
felt that she needed to be home with her earthly father, it was me responding to my soul's longing to be with the heavenly father. So I had been running home to God my entire life, and I didn't know it. Secondly, it dawned on me that the need for this physical, tangible, safe, and comforting being, I needed to attach this feeling of safety to something, so I chose what was dearest to me at the time, so I attached it to my dad. It was simply my mind's marker, my mind's imagery of what my soul was telling this little girl that has no idea of soul and what that means, was telling it what it means. So when little Elizabeth felt restless, when little Elizabeth felt distressed and empty and hurt, her soul was saying, was telling the mind, just take her home to dad. Tell her why she as she gets home to dad, she'll be okay. But now, I no longer needed a person. I no longer needed a marker. Because there on the ground, my soul had found another way home. Genesis tells us that God formed a man a man, a figure, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And now a man became the man, became a living being. We are living moment by moment on the borrowed breath of God. That was God. Do it with me. Take a deep breath. God just allowed you to be here another moment. And it is literally that simple. It is literally that basic. Every breath, every moment, God literally just breathed, just breathed his breath into your nostrils and allowed you to be here. Our soul is the core and essence of who we are. Without it, we are dust. And without it, thus we will return. But if it's borrowed, then the soul isn't ours. And if it's not ours, then we have a responsibility to care for that which God has given us. Correction, for that which God has lent us. Because ultimately, it's God's. I know a reverend, Reverend Robin, who said it best. She says, caring for our soul is an act of stewardship. It's a stewardship issue. It's about knowing how to manage and care for what God has given us or has lent to us. But how can you care for something when you don't know what it needs or when you don't know when it needs it and you don't know how much of it it needs and it changes as you grow up and it changes as, as your life changes? How can you care for something like that? Because our minds can't imagine it and we have no marker for it, so we have no idea where to start or where to even recognize that there is a need. But the soul knows what it needs and lets us know through the longing. It lets us know through the restlessness. It lets us know through the hopelessness. It lets us know through that want to no longer be around or to no longer go on or to stop for a day that listen. This is not a body problem. This is not a family problem. This is not a social problem. This is not even a you problem. This is a soul problem. This is about your borrowed breath problem. And I need you to stop and listen. A scripture reading, Psalms 42 verse 2, reads, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Our soul is God's breath, and it's going to seek to be in harmony with the heartbeat of God. If we go a verse higher, it says, As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, my God. To pant is to, is to breathe heavily, to gasp for air. So our souls are literally gasping to be with God at times. And just as I went home in anticipation of being at peace and safe just in the presence of my Father, our souls can literally have us breathing heavy, gasping in everyday life just so that we could take it to God because it needs to be with God. Reminding us that we are a borrowed breath. 
running on empty, and it needs to rest. It needs safety. It needs comfort with its God, with its creator, with its original source. In three days, we enter a new decade. Crazy to say. In three days, we enter a new decade. And we all have great hopes and great expectations for what the next 10 years will bring. But have you considered your soul? Have you planned for your soul? Have you sat down and thought about how you're going to care for this borrowed breath? I've been thinking of all the things I'm gonna leave in 2019 and I've decided that my restless soul won't make it with me into 2020. In the perfect world, our souls wouldn't need to long or feel restless or be in despair for us to know that it needs something. But the world is imperfect and we are human. So I hope instead that we will be good stewards of our souls and exercise spiritual discipline in responding to its call for restoration. In the past, restoration for my personal soul has been running home to a loving father. It's been a dramatic, probably too dramatic fall to the ground to just lay still. This last week, it was an invitation to spend time with a family who loves above all else, all else because that's what my soul needed. But for you, soul restoration may be entirely different. I was traveling home with someone um, last night. We were flying back to Jersey, and we were talking about this as I was preparing some notes. And he shared with me that for him, restoration, soul restoration, is when he's sitting at home and he's just looking back on everything that he has. Gratitude is where he finds God. But maybe for you, and this is because God has formed us all in different ways, and because we've all come to know him in different ways, and because we all have different markers for him, maybe for you your soul's restoration is praise and worship. Maybe for you it's an eat, pray, love journey where you just eat your best life in moderation. Maybe for you it's taking the time to literally rest and literally sleep. Maybe you have been working tirelessly and you have never rested and slept. Or maybe you're an artist. Maybe you're a musician and you create beauty. Maybe you're athletic and it's in working out and sweating that you feel most at peace. However you connect to who God is to you, a loving father, maybe a nurturing mother, maybe a covering spirit, maybe a mix of both, in this new decade, I encourage you to be spiritually disciplined in stewarding your borrowed breath back to the heartbeat of God. Amen. Happy Sabbath and happy new decade. Amen. 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 the deer today.